Time travel has been a theme in many books and movies, perhaps none more famous than the 1985 movie Back to the Future. I can hardly believe it's been 30 years since that movie opened. You'll remember that Marty McFly was accidentally sent 30 years into the past in a time-traveling DeLorean invented by his friend, Dr. Emmett Brown. In a strange twist common in time travel, Marty has to make sure that his high school age <coughs> parents get together as a couple in order to ensure his own existence way in the future. Of course, the movie was so successful that there had to be a Back to the Future 2, and in it, <coughs> Marty McFly goes 30 years into the future. And here's a clip from the DeLorean showing that he was going to October 21st, 2015. That's just a month from now. We're going to have to look around. When October 21st comes, we might see Marty McFly wandering around. But we learned in the movies that the slightest changes of the past can have disastrous resu results in the future. By the time the third movie came around, I found the complexities of traveling back and forth in time made the movies just a bit too confusing to me. One of the reasons is the very idea of time travel is mind-boggling. I've read and thought a good bit about time travel, and I have to tell you, I've concluded there is no such thing as time travel. I just don't think it's possible. I could be wrong about this, and this is one of many things that you may find you disagree with me about, and that's okay. But for me, I don't think time travel is possible. I don't think it's possible theoretically. I've read about what Einstein said and about his saying that if you were traveling at the speed of light, going on a spaceship for five years, you'd return to the earth and the earth would have uh, gone forward 50 years. That's time distortion because you experience time at a different rate, but it's not really time travel. I began to explore as best I could, though I'm not a scientist. And one paper I read recently said, well, maybe time travel could happen, but you could only go back as far as the time machine was created. I've read about wormholes. I've just decided I'm not convinced. I don't think time travel is possible theoretically. Furthermore, I don't think time travel is possible philosophically. I think we are stuck in the present. The past has gone the future does not yet exist. I'm going to shock you now, but I believe that the future does not even exist in the mind of God. Because if the future existed anywhere, then that means logically that we have no freedom. And for me, that is philosophically untenable. I don't think time travel is possible theologically. This involves a good bit of biblical interpretation I don't have time for now. I'll just say that I subscribe to a notion called openness theology, which says the future is open, yet to be created. This is important to me because for me it's the only way our prayers can make a difference. If the future is already predetermined, then there's no sense in praying. But if it's open, our prayers make a difference. And this says that we are co-laborers with God, creating a new future. I don't believe time travel is possible practically. Even if you don't agree with anything I've said so far, you have to agree nobody has ever really done time travel even for one second. There's a reason they call such movies and books science fiction. It is fiction. Don't forget, as a practical matter of daily life, we are stuck 
in the eternal now and time travel is not a reality. There is no such thing as time travel. I find it very interesting that the Apostle Paul talked about time in the passage we read from Philippians. He gave a brilliant statement about the relationship of the past, the present, and the future. I think no scripture in all the Bible presents so clearly the attitudes that we should have about the tenses. Paul gives a straightforward advice about the past. He says, forgetting what lies behind. About the future, he says in verse 13, straining forward to what lies ahead. And about the present, he says two things. I press on toward the goal and hold fast to what we have attained. I think it's excellent advice for all of us. I want to suggest, first of all, that this text has important applications to us as individuals. Most of us have a problem with the tenses. If you're anything like me, then perhaps you too sometimes find yourself living in the past or living in the future and not so much in the present. Too often. We live in the past. Some of us are fond of recalling the good old days. We think back when gasoline cost 25 cents, when a Coke cost 6 cents. Or maybe you were a high school athlete and you remember the glory days and the Friday night lights and you love to relive that. You know, for me personally, I have to wrestle with my mind all the time because my mind tends to focus on all my failures in the past, to think about all my tragic flaws. I've got too many embarrassing moments to tell you about. But one I can tell you, I remember distinctly when I played Little League Baseball, and we were behind in the last game of the season. There were two outs in the last inning, and little Mickey comes up to bat. I can save the day. I can win the game. And I swing and I hit this little pop-up fly that goes off to right field and the right fielder caught the ball. And it seemed like almost instantaneously they turned out the lights and everybody went home and the season was over and I had ruined it for everybody. In my mind, I forget whatever good I might have done in baseball and remember those things. Do you do that kind of thing? Sometimes we live too much in the past. And when I think about that, I think about what Paul says, forgetting what lies behind. I think God is saying to me, let it go, Mickey. Let it go. It was almost 60 years ago. Nobody remembers. Focus on the positive, Mickey. Let some of that stuff go. In the same way, we can spend too much time living in the future. You can know you're living in the future when you find yourself saying these two sentences. I can't wait until or I'll be happy when. Sometimes I think we go through the major stages of all of life living too much in the future. We say, I can't wait till I'm in junior high school. I can't wait for the Thanksgiving break. I'll be happy when Christmas comes. I'll be happy when I get my driver's license. I can't wait to graduate from high school. I can't wait to get through with college. I'll be happy when I get a job. I'll be happy when I get my first car. I can't wait to get married. We'll be happy when the baby comes. I'll be happy when I get that promotion. I can't wait for the kids to be out of the house. I'll be happy when I retire. And we wind up living our whole lives in anticipation of the future and not really 
being present in the moment. Paul tells us in verse 13, strain forward to what lies ahead. The future is out there. We should work for the future. We should hope for the future. We should lay a good foundation for the future. But we should not live in the future. Our challenge is to live in the present. One of the benefits of meditation and a new thing they call mindfulness, perhaps some of you are familiar with that, it teaches us to focus on our breathing and to really be present in the moment and experience God's grace right now. That's what we all need to be doing. You see, it's a simple fact of life. All we really have is now. The past is gone. The future is yet to be. We only have the moment. We must live in the moment. And when we do, we can find true peace and satisfaction and happiness. About the present, Paul has great words in verse 14. I press toward the goal. And in verse 16, hold fast to what we have attained. That term, hold fast, rang a bell to me when I read it. You don't hear it very often. And I remembered that I had heard it and seen it in the 2003 movie, Master and Commander, in which one of the sailors has the letters on, tattooed on his knuckles, and it says, hold fast, and he shows that up in the middle of a storm. Hold fast to what we have. That movie's based on a 20-book series by Patrick O'Brien. I've read them before, and I'm in the process of reading them again. And recently I came across a section where Patrick O'Brien marvels about the fact that sailors, men who are entirely capable, steady, and reliable in a ship at sea, the moment they get on land... They become idle, lazy, good-for-nothing drunks and spend all their money in a hurry. And he said, I think it's because at sea they're forced to live in the present. They set those sails according to the wind they have right now. The wind yesterday is gone. The wind tomorrow you can't do anything about. And on, at sea, sailors are supremely living in the moment. And as soon as they get on land, when they need to be working for the future, planning for the future, investing for the future, the poor sailors can't handle the pressure. The same thing is true in our lives. The present is the most important tense of all, and we are happiest when we can live in it. Look again at Paul's advice about the past. He says, forgetting what lies behind, about the future, straining forward to what lies ahead, about the present. I press on toward the goal, hold fast. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. But I want to suggest to you today that this Scripture has a unique application for this church. Churches must struggle with the past the present and the future, just like individuals do. Churches can live in the past, too. There's a healthy way to celebrate our past. I just finished last year writing a 560-page book on the grand history of South Elkhorn Christian Church. The past is worth remembering and celebrating. But Paul says, forgetting the past, he doesn't literally mean to forget it. He means don't live in the past. Sometimes recalling the past become, can become a negative factor in our lives, especially when the present compares unfavorably with the past. We might like to fondly recall a former pastor or the glory days when people flocked through the doors of the church I've already heard people say, I remember when there were 500 people in that church. And many say just a few years ago, there were 200. And it can become a negative factor if we dwell on the hurts of the past. 
If we focus on the declining attendance of the recent past, it will only lead to a demoralized and depressed congregation. I've got a message for those churches who want to live in the past. There is no such thing as time travel. We're not going back. We're not going back to the glory days. We have to make new glory days. In the same way, we need to forget the conflicts, the disappointments, and the hurts of the past. Even the declining attendance is yesterday's news. The most important advice I can give is what Paul said. Forgetting what lies behind It is a new day, a new dawn, a new chapter, as has already been said. It's time to reconnect and reinvest and work together to build a brighter future. It is up to us. We can't go back. We must work in the present, doing exactly what Paul said, forgetting what is behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, pressing on toward the goal, holding fast, to what we have attained. I want to conclude with some advice about how we can do exactly that. By using an analogy from riding a motorcycle. I've been riding a little motorcycle since 2003 and have ridden 70,000 miles without being killed, which I'm proud of. But I found that riding a motorcycle is one of the hardest technical skills I ever learned. I was surprised at that. It takes amazing concentration, especially in navigating a curve. Most motorcycle accidents happen in the failure to negotiate a curve. When I went to the motorcycle safety class before riding, I learned a guiding principle. And that is, you go where you look. And they emphasize, don't look at the guardrail. Don't look at the other cars. You look at exactly that little path in the curve where you want your tires to hit. And you will go where you look. The same thing's true in a car. That's why so many times when there's a policeman parked on the side of the road, somebody goes driving straight into him because they're looking at him. I found a little clip on YouTube about a motorcycle man riding on the tail of the dragon in the Smoky Mountains. I want you to see this. And here a happy rider is waving at the camera. He's doing fine. Says, so what is wrong with this picture? Nothing that appears to be wrong. As best we can tell, he never looks at anything except the Corvette in front of him. And this is the beginning of the end. Fixated on where he doesn't want to go, he can go nowhere else. That was a bad day for the motorcycle and for the Corvette. And the lesson is, you go where you look. I want to ask you, where are you looking? We will go where we look. We can focus on the mistakes of the past, on old hurts, on organizational failures, on declining attendance and lost members, that can be a depressing picture. If we look there hard and long enough, that's where we'll go. But if we focus on the positive, if we look to the future with hope, if we celebrate small victories, if we talk about what is good about this church instead of what is bad, tell other people the good things that are happening instead of recounting our list of grievances. That is where we will go. I want to suggest that every one of us make a concerted effort to look ahead, to look to the positive future that we can create together. I pray we'll do exactly what Paul said. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, press on toward the goal, hold fast to what we have.
Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we pray that we may learn from Paul. We'll learn to live in the present and build a wonderful future. We are confident that you are with us in this place, that you desire a good future, that you have plans for us, and we pray that together we can make it happen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.